So a warm welcome to everyone who's joining this specific panel and uh, good to find you all for those who've been uh, with us so far. I think this is a very interesting conversation that can go a bit deeper. And uh, in, in this panel uh, with the three guests that are joining us uh, will, uh, will help us to do so. So the focus, as Aditi was mentioning, is on antimicrobial resistances and the impact that this has uh, in conflict settings, particularly in situations of protracted crises, uh, such as Middle Eastern countries. Why this topic has been selected? Because uh, the magnitude of the antimicrobial resistance problem uh, in, uh, in these countries is the evidence about the magnitude of the burden is not yet conclusive. Uh, and this is, of course, not surprising because we all are aware of the challenges of implementing research and having proper surveillance systems in countries where uh, basic services and surveillance systems are profoundly disrupted by, by the conflict or uh, by the protracted crisis. Uh, what we know is that the vast majority of evidence comes uh, uh, historically from the military literature, so on wounds of combatants involved in combat operations, but uh, there's very little evidence about the impact this has on civilians and how these infections then spread uh, among the community. This gap in evidence has partly been filled by MSF thanks to the uh, amazing research projects that have been conducted uh, in, in particularly in Jordan in the reconstructive surgical project. Uh, and now there's more and more awareness, uh, not only among the humanitarian community, but also on the local uh, academic communities on, on the topic. Uh, just probably a brief introduction on why we wanted to focus on, um, on, on this issue is that there are, and we're all aware that there are multiple pathways through which uh, antimicrobial resistances and antibiotic resistances in particular can develop in this uh, context uh, in, in the Middle East and where there is conflict. So they can spread because of disruption of healthcare services. Uh, they can spread because of delayed access uh, to care for, uh, for patients and civilians who are wounded and then therefore uh, can, uh, can have a growth and can, uh, and can, develop, can receive suboptimal dosages of antibiotics because the, the drugs are not available. Uh, at the same time, uh, there might be drugs that are not available and therefore uh, they receive uh, suboptimal uh, formulations. Uh, there's, uh, there's, there can be an increased nosocomial transmission because of poor infection prevention and control practices, but there can also be an enhanced uh, community transmission due to, for example, overcrowding in, uh, in refugee settings. Uh, there can be poor antimicrobial stewardship and so on and so forth. So all these aspects are very well been described in a protracted crisis, but I think the conversation of today uh, goes to another level and uh, shed lights on topics that, are being, that have been often overlooked. And in particular, it will focus on a uh, fo few new perspectives. One is the environmental side of antimicrobial resistances, on which there's very little uh, evidence uh, and on which there's been a beautiful research that has been uh, done in Gaza and that uh, Rima Bushomar will present us. But also now innovation can really bring solutions uh, not only to diagnostics uh, uh, along the lines of what Jean-Baptiste has already been uh, telling us in the previous session, not only in the diagnostics, but also in the management of antimicrobial resistances. And that's where uh, then Dr. Nabil will, uh, will conclude, let's say, the presentation. So without further hesitation, I would probably uh, share my screen to just give a, a brief uh, outline of, uh, of how our day is gonna, is gonna look like. And uh, so, we will, uh, we will have a 10 minutes uh, presentation from each of the panelists. Uh, then we will try to dedicate the, the vast majority of the remaining time to the question and answers from the audience. And uh, uh, depending on how many questions we receive, we will then uh, try to wrap up uh, in, in the last five to, to 10 minutes. So the first panelist that I would uh, welcome to contribute is uh, Rima Mushomer. She's a public health specialist uh, from Gaza, and she works in the program coordination unit of the Palestinian Water Authority. Uh, she has a master in public health uh, and is currently a candidate for a PhD. And she has an extensive experience in coordination of multidisciplinary research projects, uh, uh, such as the fascinating one that she will presenting to us uh, in a short while. 
Uh, she's worked both with the national and international organizations, uh, particularly in public health, water, sanitation, and hygiene. And she's going to explain to us how uh, antimicrobial resistance actually can find its roots also in, uh, in, in the environment surrounding premises of health facilities or community and how we can tackle this uh, in a sort of one health perspective. So without further hesitation, uh, Rim, the floor is yours and uh, please let me know when you would like me to move to, to the next uh, Okay. Next slide. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Cloud, for your uh, introduction about the session and for introducing me. Um, actually, I'm, I'm privileged to, to be part of this uh, uh, panel discussion uh, within the Asia Scientific Day. And um, um, I'll be speaking during the few minutes about the importance of considering water and safety of water sanitation and hygiene services at healthcare facilities, uh, in particular in, uh, within the context that suffer from protracted conflicts uh, like uh, uh, Palestine, in particular Gaza. Uh, so, <clears throat> um, um, besides the uh, be, uh, besides considering health uh, as a basic human right, uh, water and sanitation are also a basic human rights, and they are central to achieve the sustainable development goals, in particular goal number six. And it was cited by Dr. Tidoris last year that wash or safety of water sanitation within healthcare facilities is considered among the uh, the most urgent challenges for this decade. Um, given uh, the fact that uh, most of the literature supports that hospital environment is a home for antimicrobial resistance and it can uh, move uh, uh, within hospitals uh, either um, through uh, admitted patients uh, or admitted uh, or staff, medical staff, uh, and can also reach the hospitals uh, through uh, unsafe water supply. Uh, in addition, that uh, uh, it's the, the antimicrobial resistant bacteria can move out of the hospitals uh, through the medical wastewater that can reach uh, recreational areas such as seawater, uh, as in our context in Gaza. Um, um, uh, when speaking about Gaza, this, uh, the southern part of the Palestinian territory, is which uh, located in the western part of Asia, between the Mediterranean Sea and Jordan River, and it has a long history of occupation, um, uh, displacement, uh, fragmentation. Uh, um, uh, in addition to that, in the Gaza Strip, uh, people are suffering from lack of uh, safe water uh, because most of, almost any all of uh, its water resources, the aquifer is contaminated either by uh, uh, nitrate or by microbiological contamination. It's also uh, characterized by having high salinity, so it's not fit for human use. Um, uh, in addition to that, this, this water supply reach reach not only the community, it reached the hospitals and uh, it, it provided uh, uh, them with the uh, needed supply, water supply for um, infection control and uh, hygiene uh, activities. Um, um, we can move to the next slide, please, uh, if possible. Uh, and this is, uh, this is the, the figure that shows how uh, antimicrobial resistance can move in and out of the hospital and uh, how the wastewater can carry uh, antimicrobial resistance to reach the, uh, the seawater uh, as in our case in Gaza Strip. Uh, the second slide, please. And uh, uh, it's uh, uh, considering water and sanitation uh, safety within and uh, antimicrobial resistance 
uh, is uh, a global concern because it, it has been uh, 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 highlighted by the WHO that uh, investing in the safety of water and sanitation will reduce uh, uh, nosocomial infection, including the, uh, that caused by uh, microbial resistance. Um, so uh, back to our uh, pilot study that has been conducted in the Gaza Strip, which uh, uh, was aiming to uh, determine the level of antimicrobial resistance within the water uh, hygiene facilities and the wastewater uh, samples that has been collected from two uh, governmental hospitals uh, in Gaza. Um, and the, the results showed a um, high level of bacterial contamination that uh, reached, uh, um, with, for example, uh, the, the testing was done for um, uh, some selected bacteria, which according to, to clinical information, uh, uh, were, uh, were prevalent in the Gaza Strip, such as uh, Enterobacteriaceae, uh, um, uh, Sodomonas, uh, uh, Enterobacter, and uh, Staph aureus. And the results uh, showed high level of uh, bacterial contamination within the collected sample. For, for sure, it will be, we, we have collected a few samples from the wastewater. It was about seven samples out of 350. And uh, 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 it was expected that we, we will be finding uh, a microwave uh, bacterial uh, resistance within uh, the wastewater sample. But the, the shocking finding was that it was present in water resources, in water samples collected from the tap water. It's also where where in some cases at the resource level from the wells. Uh, in addition to that, it was found in uh, the swab samples correct, collected from uh, the surfaces of uh, hand washing facilities, uh, which, uh, uh, which uh, can provide evidence that uh, it's there in the uh, uh, water and sanitation uh, services, and it can be transmitted while uh, washing hands, while drinking uh, this water, um, uh, uh, um, transmitted to patients or to the staff uh, uh, and reach them and make complicate the issues. Uh, the, the problem in such condition like Gaza is that uh, it's suffering from uh, a protracted, I just said, a conflict and uh, there is a, an overwhelming uh, healthcare system uh, this is in addition to the limited control of, of, over the natural resources like water and uh, being unable to operate uh, uh, large uh, uh, projects related to the wastewater treatment because of lack of electricity, etc. So the, the, the whole uh, uh, factors would uh, help to uh, to exaggerate the, uh, the already existing uh, antimicrobial resistant problem uh, at healthcare facilities in, in such uh, um, settings. Uh, if you allow, if you can move to the next slide, please. Yes. Uh, before this slide, uh, uh, one of the results also uh, uh, was uh, uh, highlighting the level of uh, ESBEL producing bacteria within the sample, the, the percentage was about 22% uh, of the uh, enterobacteriaceae where uh, ISBEL producing. And also for the modified Hodgkin test uh, that shows the caponemin resistant uh, uh, percentage, uh, it was about 14% of the enterobacteriaceae uh, uh, were positive for uh, modified Hodgkin testing. Uh, for the uh, antibiotic resistant profile, this is an example for the uh, enterobacteriaceae isolates uh, that shows the, the level of resistance uh, uh, by sample type. Uh, for example, to make it simple, for the swab samples, you will find more than in about 
100 uh, percent of the uh, enterobacteria uh, uh, resistant isolates uh, were resistant to amikacin, to uh, cipatazidime, and uh, to uh, to also uh, chloramphenicol. Yeah, no, it's for cipatazidone uh, and also for uh, piperacillin tazobactam. In addition, for uh, more than two thirds of the sample, were resistant to, uh, from water and wastewater, were resistant to amikacin. In addition to cyclazactone, uh, and also for the imipenem, uh, uh, which uh, highlight the level of antibiotic resistance within the collected sample. Um, um, in addition to that, uh, there was a screening for uh, uh, resistant genes, and uh, it was unfortunately it was detected there. Uh, so, uh, Isbel genes such as OFSA, such as uh, CTXM, were detected in the samples, collected samples, in addition to NDM gene for terpenemum resistant, um, which highlight uh, uh, also the, uh, the probability of influencing um, the surrounding bacteria through uh, horizontal gene transmission uh, that the bacteria that uh, doesn't carry the resistant uh, uh, genes will be able to be resistant for um, uh, antibiotics if they were uh, at the same uh, environment with, with those uh, bacteria. Uh, to, to conclude, uh, the, the results uh, revealed high levels of uh, contamination within the collected samples. Uh, it's not about only a bacterial uh, uh, contamination. In a, it's also about the, the genes responsible for resistance. It was there when the screening uh, was done. And uh, it shows that we need to consider water uh, sanitation and hygiene safety within healthcare facilities, not only to speak about uh, uh, AMR stewardship at clinical level, but we need to also, to also consider uh, additional factors that can influence. I like the term used by Dr. Paul Hunter uh, uh, that I have feared during the last, uh, one of the last uh, workshops when he used uh, the, the wash stewardship. So we need to, 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 uh, to ensure that both uh, wash and AMR stewardship are in place uh, at the healthcare facilities. Uh, to have more uh, effective uh, infection prevention and control programs. And um, yeah, um, I think um, if, uh, if I may uh, uh, leave the floor back to Dr. Claudia uh, so she can uh, move in to the next panelist. Thank you very much, Reem. And this indeed is enlightening, particularly because your presentation comes during this week that is also the Global Water Week. And there has been more and more calls, uh, if you read about uh, all the major stakeholders working in WASH, there has been major alerts that have been raised uh, starting last Monday on the importance of ensuring access to safe uh, water in the community, of course, but also in, uh, in healthcare facility and how the scarcity of water might affect in the in the long term even the stability of certain contexts. Now, if we consider this in the specific setting of the Middle East, which already contains some of the most water scarce uh, countries uh, all across our planet, then we see how relevant it is to focus on ensuring that the basis of the possibility of having some safe uh, infection prevention and control practices in healthcare facilities are implemented. And I think this leads very nicely into um, into what Dr. Jean-Baptiste will, uh, will briefly tell us. Uh, for those who have uh, joined us only in this uh, section, perhaps a few words to introduce him. He's a biologist and biotechnologist laboratory analyst by training that has had an extensive experience, uh, over 10 years experience in implementing laboratory capacity strengthening in uh, low and middle income countries, both with MSF and with WHO. Through these experiences, he has developed a specific focus of interest that is the one on clinical bacteriology, 
that moved him into pursuing further studies, an MPH, uh, a doctoral degree, uh, and uh, that is uh, now completing or has completed, he will, uh, he will tell us. Uh, he joined the, the headquarters of MESEF Paris in 2012, where he's been basically involved in the development of this mini lab project that he described uh, briefly uh, to us in the previous session uh, to find basically uh, this was the way to find and strengthen uh, the capacity of monitoring microbial infection and antimicrobial resistances in context where laboratory capacity is not as strong as it is. Uh, quite a groundbreaking initiative, this mini lab project. Uh, uh, but if we put it into the context of the global approach of MSF uh, towards tackling antimicrobial resistances, I think uh, it's uh, it, it really develops farther on uh, on what you Reem have just been uh, describing to us. So, Dr. Jean Baptiste, floor is uh, is yours. Thank you, Dr. Claudia. So, thanks for the introduction. And indeed, so, so just to, to come back quickly, the Minilab is, on, is only one tool among the others that MSF is developing and that, uh, that will be discussed today. So um, as you mentioned just earlier, MSF and other actors have, have documented in, in several studies that in the context uh, where MSF works, children hospitalized with sepsis, immunocompromised patient or victims of traumatic injury or burns are, are particularly uh, vulnerable for infection caused by antibiotic resistance uh, bacteria, known as uh, AVR. And, and low resource uh, area conflict and emergency settings are confronted with, with lack of data on, on this uh, ABR, as you just mentioned, because they have limited options for diagnosis and treatment and unregulated use of antibiotics uh, in out of hospitals, and as you were mentioned, other uh, problematic. But as well, they, they, they do not have sufficient human resources, adapted guidelines, trainings, leadership, and coordination is poorly equipped to, to address the, this issue. MSF has as well documented the emergence of uh, ABR or AMR, so antibiotic resistance or antimicrobial resistance, so you will find the two terms, in several projects since 2009. Uh, but there is still a gap in our knowledge on, on the extent of these problems, meaning that it, in most of the countries where MSF work, we do not have reliable ideas of the type and rate of bacterial resistance. Uh, as an example, in 2019, only nine out of 47 African countries and nine out of 21 MENA countries provide data on the level of AMR to the, to the Global Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance System from, from, the, from WHO. MSF as such as a unique opportunity to build evidence and tackle challenges in contexts where no other actors are present, uh, based on the needs of the most vulnerable patients. Um, MSF has recognized, just to give you some history, uh, MSF has recognized ABR as a priority in 2015, and an intersectional roadmap uh, was developed in a multidisciplinary uh, task force composed of medical experts, representatives from operation, an access campaign uh, and to, to guide antibiotic resistance control in, uh, in MSF. And the objective of first this, this roadmap was to highlight the main direction and the focus on action for MSF regarding ABR and to support MSF staff to implement uh, ABR control activity and to help MSF decision maker in planning and implementing antibiotic uh, resistance control strategy. Um, so, can you can you display the, the, the slides that I just uh, I just sent to you, please? So, ba based, thank you so much, Claudia. So, based upon this work, uh, MSF has designed context adapted antib antib antibiotic resistance strategy in country across the world around three pillars. You can see. So, first, which is the the most important, which I just mentioned in my previous talk and that is often forgotten is the IPC. And as Rim was saying, so, so, so IPC being part as well of the WASH initiative. So how to improve, to prevent and control the, the, the spread of, 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 bact of bacteria or another community infection and so on. And then as, as well, on top of that, there is the implementation of antibiotic stewardship. So which is to improve the knowledge of the practitioner on how to best use the, the different antibiotics, how to, to de-escalate, to escalate, and, and so much to, to be done on this field of expertise. So, so these two pillars are, are called as a basic package that we should and we try to implement in each of our fields with difficulties, of course, and we are going to discuss a bit. 
And on top of that, when it's when it's ready or like in different uh, contexts, especially MSF has recognized uh, some priority project to, in, to implement microbiology, which is in reconstructive surgery or trauma centers, intensive care, when there is neonatal intensive care, of course, uh, HIV uh, project country with uh, with high multidrug resistance uh, uh, infection or with as well uh, kids or malnourished uh, malnourished children and many others that I forgot to mention in the priority project. Um, so in 2019, MSF supported health care activity in over 70 countries and, and provided support to 204 hospitals around. 20 projects. Uh, as of 2020, 20 projects reported antibiotic stewardship activity in 16 countries, so meaning uh, the full packages. MSF has, has established for that uh, five functioning clinical bacteriology laboratories around the world, such as Mali, Jordan, Liberia, Central African Republic, and Yemen, and with partnering with different uh, private and public structures, so improving their, their capacity in 14 other sites mainly uh, in the Middle East. So today, uh, MSF main ABR activity uh, is in Middle East, as uh, we mentioned, so such as Amman, Aden, Iraq, Gaza, where MSF has implemented trauma units equipped to, to manage visceral orthopedic and reconstructive surgery, surgical uh, projects uh, for the population affected by the different uh, conflicts uh, in the area. All the projects have a multidisciplinary approach to manage uh, patients with complex bone and tissue infections. So as I just mentioned, mainly due to, to the high, uh, to the highly resistance uh, organism that you can, that you can have uh, in this area. This includes, as we mentioned, the IPC, so the three pillars. So with robust of the, the robustness of the three pillar. To go a bit more in detail in this particular area, I would focus on Jordan. So as an example, so in, this, uh, in these countries, uh, MSF has, has opened since 2009, now with a, a major orthopedic and reconstructive surgical hospital with strong and quality IPC, antibiotic stewardship, and clinical bacteriology laboratory. Did not come uh, directly like this, so it, it was improved slowly by slowly. And so this, uh, this, this hospital so, uh, accept all the, the patients, the difficult cases and that are referred from the different conflicts and mainly for osteomyelitis and reconstructive surgery. So despite the reduction of activity between 2019 and 2020 due to the COVID, they have treated 130 patients, complex patients. Uh, among them, 52% had an osteomyelitis, so it's an infection of the bones. And 53% of the osteomyelitis was due to multidrug resistance organism. So you can go on the website to see what is the definition and what are the different criteria of, of, of multidrug resistance. Uh, of these patients infected with uh, MDRO, so multidrug resistance organism, 55% was due to uh, MRSA. So it's a methicillin resistance Staphylococcus aureus, which is one of the major uh, nosocomial infection uh, uh, organism, and followed by 20% of Enterobacteria C uh, resistant to third generation cephalosporin, such as the ceftriaxone, which is a widely used antibiotics as a second line defense. So, in terms of we speak about first line, second line, third line defense or, or use of drugs. And the, the, the finally, the carbapenemas resistance enterobacteria C, which is like a very highly resistant uh, germs, has occurred in, in 13% of the patients uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in these regions. And it's much higher than, than anywhere we, we, we see in the literature in Europe or, or in, in this type of, of, uh, of, similar, uh, of similar hospitals. And we have done several studies that have been published uh, as well. But however, despite the achievement in this project, we, we faced many challenges. So response to nosocomial epidemic in intra-hospital transmission, uh, a recurring problem that exists in all our areas. Uh, clearly, IPC is the foundation upon which all IBR-related activities are based, and a commitment to strengthening this pillar is really essential. Uh, creating an IPC army for our hospital-based teams, including those in emergency, wash, res response, or remote projects. 
Then the second uh, challenge is, is finding a specialized room, human resources in both international and field staff. Uh, luckily, in, in Middle East Africa, we have a, a high uh, trained personnel, but still not enough in this field of expertise. And there is a clear need for a standardized approach to, to, to education, capacity building. So we are trying to achieve some two interventions such as developing e-learning, focus on multidisciplinary approach. And, and the third part is, uh, of the challenges, as we just mentioned, it's to improve access to, to reliable macrology through the implementation of all partnering with conventional clinical bacteria laboratory. And at the end, in, in remote area or in difficult to reach area to, to implement the, the, the mini lab in, in our context. Um, just to, to conclude a bit, while MSF is reinforcing the deployment of, of ABR intervention, it is clear that improving access to ABR activity lies with access to trained human resources, but as well development of novel tools adapted to this context. So as such, uh, MSF is currently developing several tools, and, and the next speaker will discuss about it a bit, uh, to tackle some issues so, such as the MSF eCare, which is the digital clinical decision support algorithm to, to, to support the clinician, the Antibiogo, which is a mobile application on the, on the phone to read the antibiotic susceptibility testing, e-learning modules that are under development to train practitioners, uh, lab presented earlier. And as we just mentioned, the, the mini lab will give as well a unique capacity to MSF and partners to, to deploy rap rapidly a, a laboratory on, on site. Uh, the, the, the most important is to understand that fighting AMR is very complex. Uh, it is important. It requires a multidisciplinary approach, yet uh, difficult and challenging to set up in humanitarian environment. However, as medical care organization, it is our responsibility to act for better care of our patients. And it's the responsibility of all the, the medical environment and much beyond. And I'd like to give you back the, the, the floor, so Claudia. Thank you very Thanks. much, Jean-Baptiste. I, I found it very interesting and it's always uh, nice to see, and this, I say it as a former MSF myself, uh, it's always nice to see how pioneeristic MSF uh, has been and keeps being uh, in uh, tackling issues that are extremely complex. What I like very much of your presentation is this idea of the pyramid approach, uh, which reinforces you know, we need to have a solid base before we can tackle antibiotic resistances at the tertiary level of care, such as MSF is doing in, uh, in Jordan. If we do not tackle IPC practices and antibiotic stewardship, not only in hospitals, but also in primary healthcare centers, which according to certain studies is where 80% of the global antibiotic prescription is happening, then of course, all the efforts that we might concentrate in highly specialized care might not really help in tackling the issue itself. So I would uh, say this, uh, looking forward to hear more about uh, the other developments uh, on which MSF is working. And um, I would like to introduce Dr. Nabil, who is our last panelist uh, today uh, for this specific uh, session. Uh, he's a medical doctor uh, with a PhD by training, was focused his research since 2009 on hospital acquired infections uh, and characterization of the molecular epidemiology and antimicrobial resistant features of clinical important bacteria. He's also the volunteer leader of uh, uh, fascinating, what sounds a very fascinating project, such as the telemicrobiology in uh, humanitarian crisis project. Uh, and he works also as project advisors for uh, NORWAC, the Norwegian Aid Committee, mainly in response to the needs of Syrian uh, population affected by the Syrian crisis. So let's say after having heard about uh, the occupied Palestinian territories in Jordan, we move now uh, to, to hear more about Syria from the region, and we look very much forward to have your contribution, Dr. Nabil. Please let me know whenever you would like me to share uh, the screen and your slides. Thank you, Claudia. Thanks for the nice introduction, and uh, thanks to the organizing committee for inviting me to take part in this uh, session. Uh, I, I read in the chat room that uh, Dr. Lukman Hakim is asking why Middle East, why you select this topic, uh, AMR in the Middle East. Uh, I think uh, it's a unique setting. 
So in addition to the usual factors that, that promote the spread of anti antimicrobial resistance in the Middle East, we are talking about the chronic conflict for 30, 40 years. With the conflict, you have uh, uh, setting-related factors that that uh, that are not present in other settings. Uh, and here I can just name a few examples. It's like the borders between the community and the field hospitals, because here you are not talking about hospitals during the conflict. You are talking about field hospitals, and there is a very fake or very unclear border between the community and the hospital acquired infections, for example. Uh, among other uh, things is the, you know, the, the control of antibiotics. For example, we faced the challenge that some fake antibiotics entered the, the, the northern region of Syria uh, because there was no ability to control the quality of the medicine in, in this region at some point. So uh, the uh, uh, heavy metals uh, contamination of the environment, we think that uh, during conflict, there is an increase in the rate of con uh, contamination with heavy metals in the, uh, in the environment. And I think we all know that heavy metal uh, resistance to heavy metals and antibiotics could coexist actually. So they support each other uh, among others. So uh, now moving to, to our telemicrobiology project. Please, Claudia, if you show the first slide. Yes. So uh, the, the next slide. Uh, so uh, the, the project, uh, actually, it's, it's a one and a half year uh, uh, project. Uh, we implemented this project in the northern region of Syria. Just to give you some, some basic uh, data, uh, this region used to host uh, around 2 million. Now it's, it's like double the population. So now we are talking about 4 million, and which means that we have 2 million internally displaced people living in this region. Uh, many of them, they live in a, a inappropriate uh, camps, uh, in, in uh, informal set, uh, settlements, and some of them are living in the in cities and uh, towns. Uh, our project, uh, and uh, also to, to give you some, uh, some idea, that in this region, we faced a huge uh, flee of doctors abroad due to the conflict, which is normal. Uh, we also faced the destruction of more than 50% of the uh, of the hospitals and primary health care centers. So only 50% of the uh, of the capacity or the health care uh, system capacity is is functioning. Uh, and uh, uh, so what what we wanted as a solution, we wanted to find uh, to to uh, you know to compensate for this lack lack of staff and lack of uh, of equipment, lack of uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, and the idea for us was to use uh, telemedicine. So to use technology and uh, information technology and uh, communication technology to compensate for the lack of staff. Uh, and then we were really lucky to get a uh, fund from, uh, from a donor. And uh, then the project started. Uh, it, it, the idea of the project is very simple. So we will establish a semi-mobile uh, uh, laboratory uh, and by semi-mobile, I mean that we can move it actually. So if the security situation became really become really bad, so we can move to another region. Uh, and here you can see it on the slide uh, in the left uh, corner, uh, up, uh, upper corner. So uh, and then what we want, we just provided the local staff with uh, with a simple camera to add to the uh, microscope, and then we also bought a machine, a special machine where you can uh, put the plates, the culture plates, uh, and it will help you to take a picture. Also, it will help you to read the antimicrobial susceptibility uh, pattern. Uh, and then we started to communicate with the with the staff. We started to do some kind of uh, SOPs, uh, learning, and how to do the the culture, how to read the results, and uh, and uh, etc. Uh, and we managed to make a short pilot study. So we included in this uh, pilot study uh, 74 uh, urinary tract uh, uh, isolates. They are all community acquired. So uh, as you can see, the the lab is not uh, linked to a hospital. It's in the in the in the city, uh, and the good thing that uh, we focused on uh, on uh, uh, antibiotic resistance for sure, and uh, you can see in the in the uh, uh, lower right corner uh, that 
we faced some challenges at the beginning. It's, it's a very simple thing, is how to read the zone. Should we go to the inner uh, cycle or should we go to the uh, uh, outer cycle, etc. And the, the good thing that uh, by the time we were receiving less questions from the local staff. So the first time it was like many questions and then after like few few weeks, it was less questions. Now actually it's mainly just to approve the results. So our, our role now is just to uh, double check that they are doing the correct identification of the bacteria at, at some level, and then to, to uh, make sure that the antimicrobial susceptibility test is done and uh, uh, read in a correct way. Uh, if you move to the next slide, uh, uh, Claudia. So uh, I have, uh, if, if you want, I can talk now about some challenges and, and uh, like uh, future plans for this project. Or if you want, we can take it in the discussion, Claudia. It's, it's up to you. Uh, should I move or should we continue first with that? I, I think there are, uh, I'm receiving already a few questions. Uh, so if you would like to expand on that, because there will be additional questions then uh, in the Q&A part. So I think we can spend some time on it. It's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, good. Uh, so uh, so uh, moving from the telemicrobiology to uh, uh, the management of antimicrobial resistance in general. Uh, in, in, uh, in our opinion, there is a room for innovation in every aspect, in every level of, uh, of uh, any action plan against antimicrobial resistance. Uh, you can, uh, you can uh, talk about a very simple and easy uh, uh, in, uh, public engagement initiatives. Uh, and here I show in this, in, in this slide, uh, it's, it's uh, done by the Public Health uh, in, uh, Institute in Canada. So they simply, they were sending letters to the parents to thank them for not using antibiotics when it's a flu, for example. In my, in my opinion, that was a fascinating uh, idea. This can be, uh, 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 the, uh, you know, repeated in, in many countries. I think we can do the same by thanking the, the general pra uh, pra uh, practitioners in the primary health care centers not to use antibiotics and so on. Uh, a bit more advanced, let's say, also uh, some kind of initiative to include the, the community in the, in the action plan against antimicrobial resistance is the, the, this uh, uh, website uh, that uh, called Superheroes Against uh, Superbacks. Uh, they, they use uh, cartoons. Uh, it's, it's a very, very uh, amazing way to motivate students, to motivate uh, young generations to, to know and to, uh, to know and to act about antimicrobial uh, resistance. Uh, I really advise you to go to this website and watch uh, uh, this website and watch some of these uh, videos. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, yeah, just uh, enjoyable actually. Uh, then if we move from this, uh, and here I, I would really thank Kareem for her amazing, nice, uh, nice uh, presentation. Uh, wash and uh, the, the uh, action against antibiotic resistance. Now, if we go, uh, if we stay in the same slide, yeah. So uh, also uh, in the wash uh, sector, there's a lot to do when it comes to uh, to the management of uh, fecal waste. Uh, and here I, I just show few examples in the in the bottom. Uh, it's done by the Oxfam uh, University. Uh, so they are using, for exam, uh, example, some uh, tiger worm uh, uh, fecal uh, bots, which will help you to, to, to uh, digest the fecal on site. Uh, uh, we know that uh, actually the, the uh, fecal contamination could be one major road for antimicrobial resistance, especially in, in uh, areas where it's conflict. And uh, there, uh, like in Gaza, for example, I think we, we have a lot of uh, reports about contamination, even for the hospital source of water. I think Reem can uh, comment about this, but uh, if, if I'm not wrong, there was some reports that even the, the, tap, the water that is reaching the hospitals is contaminated sometimes with, with, the, with the fecal uh, uh, microflora. Uh, then moving from wash, moving from awareness, we can go to the uh, diagnostics. And certainly there is a huge room for, uh, for uh, innovations uh, uh, in the diagnostic uh, uh, field. Uh, and here, just to make it clear, uh, being in a crisis, 
doesn't mean that we should use all our money, all our capacity to help the people directly. Certainly, it's, it's a need to, to address the acute needs, but also innovations. It's, uh, if, if we think a bit long term, investing a little of the budget on in innovations will help the, the, the beneficiaries, maybe indirectly, maybe not, not this year, but hopefully after a few years. Uh, there is a huge room to improve the uh, diagnostics uh, um, and uh, at, at both levels, phenotypic and genotypic. And again, uh, when we talk about uh, countries with low resources, we always think that, okay, let's do phenotypic, let's do the basic things. Let's, yes, certainly we, we need to continue with the basic things. But there is no reason not to improve the, uh, and not to go to the very uh, more accurate methods. Uh, here, I, I just have uh, an example. It's in the bottom uh, right corner of the slide. It's, uh, it's a molecular method. So we are using the DNA, which is a much more accurate than the phenotypic methods, to uh, diagnose uh, bacteria. Uh, the method called LAMB. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, doesn't need a PCR machine even. So you don't need a PCR machine. It can be read uh, visually. Uh, so uh, the only uh, the only challenge is to teach or to 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 have uh, which is very limited technical uh, support uh, to teach the local staff how to do this project uh, this uh, method and uh, read the result. Uh, this LAMP technique uh, is, can be used for every uh, or for almost any pathogen, including viruses. So it can be also used for COVID-19. Uh, then it will be called RT LAMP, like reverse transcriptase LAMP. Uh, uh, speaking about uh, uh, TP, uh, and uh, the, the previous session was very interesting in, in about the uh, antibiotic resistant uh, TP from uh, Myanmar and uh, India. Uh, actually, there is a TB lamp uh, project. Uh, it's, it's running in several countries now. Uh, I think including Bangladesh, uh, in Zambia, in Gambia. Uh, they, are, they are using this technique, uh, which doesn't need a infrastructure, like a heavy infrastructure, and, doesn't, uh, uh, and the cost is somehow efficient, uh, which is also as, uh, as accurate as the PCR-based uh, 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 technique. So just in summary, in my opinion, uh, we can have innovations. We have to have innovations. And we can have innovations in our uh, action plan uh, against uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance. Uh, we, need more, uh, we need more advocacy that uh, there should be more fund to, to uh, promote uh, scientists all over the world to do and to take part in, in uh, innovations. In, uh, in the crisis setting. So when we say crisis setting, just don't think that innovations doesn't fit here. Actually, it's, actually it's probably the more urgent place to, to, to do innovations. Um, and then if we move to the last slide. Uh, yeah, this is just uh, it's another innovation or in, uh, it's for me, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, it's just a website where you can, uh, uh, where you have visually supported uh, way to read the data. So it's, it's a normal, like you, we are talking about, uh, for example, the disease burden of uh, TB by the, by the previous session. So if you go to this website, and here you can have the link uh, uh, to, uh, to this, uh, the web address uh, for this website. Uh, so, uh, uh, if you go to this uh, uh, website, you can see actually not only read the, the numbers, but you can see uh, visually uh, how, uh, what is the size of the burden of this disease. Uh, and then you can move from global. So, if you see in this slide uh, in the left uh, upper corner, you can see the global, uh, the global uh, burden. Uh, uh, the, of the diseases. And then if you go to the right uh, side of the, of the slide, you will see the difference between uh, low income countries and high income countries. And you can directly see that uh, infectious diseases, TB, HIV, etc., they are hugely, uh, the, the proportion in the low income countries is much, much bigger than the, the uh, high income countries.
you can exactly you can see these two uh, on the top it's uh, it's uh, high income countries and on the bottom it's the low income countries uh, if you want i can share my screen and i can show you the tb uh, if or i i already yeah so i can do it and here Yes. So uh, now I think you can see my screen, right? Yes, it's visible. Thank you. Uh, so uh, now if we go uh, global and we look at the TB, for example, since the, the previous uh, session was about TB, you can see actually that uh, the, uh, the uh, percentage of uh, dis disability adjusted uh, life years is around the global one is around 1.86. Uh, and there is uh, some kind of improvement in the rate uh, in the last 20 years of around 3.1%. 3, uh, 3 That's the global one. And now if we go to uh, India, you will see how things are moving. And then the TB actually, it's instead of the, the percentage, instead of two, it's now much higher. It's like almost double, it's 3.35. But the good thing that there is improvement in the rate. So the improvement in the rate is, in, is somehow uh, uh, comparable to the global improvement in the rate. If we go to Myanmar, You will see actually that the the uh, the percentage is, is the higher. But the good thing actually that in Myanmar I can see directly, and I'm not expert. I, I this is the first time that I look at this uh, data uh, in in this region of the world. Uh, I but I can see, which is a very good thing, that there is improvement in the last 20 years of five percent when it comes to the disability adjusted uh, uh, life years. The striking thing was directly for me, it's the HIV, the uh, AIDS uh, in Myanmar. And if you can see, uh, I can go again to the global. So the global actually, there is uh, the, the situation is, uh, is not improving for sure. So we can see that the, uh, in the last 20 years, there is a decrease of 1.5. Uh, uh, percent uh, in the in the uh, in the disability adjusted life years uh, that's the global rate but if we go to myanmar you can see actually the rate in the last 20 years was 40 per uh, 14 percent so it's seven times more than the global rate uh, uh, in in the uh, you know moving backwards when it comes to hiv so for me, such a website that can uh, give you some visual support to read the data, that's, in, in my opinion, that will help me to talk to, to students, for example, to, to uh, you know, uh, advocate for my case that, okay, look, we need to do something for HIV uh, in Myanmar, for example. Uh, and Absolutely. here I will stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Nabil. And I'm just trying to be mindful about the time because there are many questions uh, coming in from for the different panelists and uh, we have a little uh, time left so i would like to address them as much as possible uh, this tool uh, done by the i think is the institute of health uh, metrics and evaluation is indeed a very powerful one and it would be fascinating if in the global burden of disease study for example there could be uh, something to quantify what's the uh, disability or mortality that is due to antibiotic resistances, which is done in certain contexts, but not as much in others. And we know that exactly in countries that have the highest uh, incidence of infectious diseases, we also have the most limited availability of data, as uh, Jean-Baptiste was uh, highlighting. So many challenges ahead. Uh, I will just uh, take a few questions. Uh, perhaps I will start with two inquiries that were directed to RIM. One is, 
Is there any published research about studies uh, on the burden of uh, multidrug resistance and the miscellaneous of waterborne infection? So this is the, the first uh, question. And the second one, which are the most prevalent uh, microorganismal infections, uh, uh, whether bacterial or otherwise, in, uh, in your specific setting? Uh, for the, the first question, is any published article about uh, a, a resistance, if I understood well, waterborne diseases? And uh, if, I, if I may explain that waterborne diseases could be caused even by non infectious uh, uh, agents, uh, but considering infections, um, uh, for example, diarrheal cases, we have diarrheal cases in Palestine. There is a, a published uh, articles about that. However, it's under control uh, 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 by the Ministry of Health and the uh, UNRWA, which provides services to refugee camps. Uh, you will be finding uh, uh, a, a lot of publication about uh, uh, resistance to Shirishia coli that can cause uh, 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 diarrheal diseases. Um, uh, in a, I'm trying to remember, uh, for example, other other bacteria like cholera is, is fortunately not there, uh, but uh, a visual monitoring system uh, 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 is in a place uh, by the Ministry of Health and uh, UNRWA to keep an eye because of the deteriorated situation uh, at, human, at human, humanitarian level, uh, especially in the presence of uh, uh, wastewater uh, uh, crisis um, uh, that uh, um, uh, can reach uh, the sea uh, water, the, which is the only recreational place. You will be find uh, a lot of publication about the contamination uh, levels, high contamination levels of seawater uh, with uh, antimicrobial resistant bacteria also. Uh, that can uh, uh, be expected to cause uh, uh, health impacts for people who uh, uh, use it for recreational uh, purposes. Um, however, the, the issue of linking, trying to link the health impact uh, I mean, it's, it's the area, if it's, uh, for example, sometimes uh, we were trying to connect it with uh, uh, some kinds of uh, meningitis, some types of meningitis uh, that affected children who uh, uh, practice swimming in the seawater. But it was difficult uh, due to the limited uh, capabilities of uh, labs here. And also, uh, you need uh, to have this, uh, to, uh, to prove this uh, kind of association, uh, to have a well-designed uh, uh, study um, like case control or um, uh, other uh, studies that uh, depend on the strong methodology. Uh, the other question was uh, was about, the, if, you, if you can remind me, it's, uh, yeah, which are the most uh, prevalent uh, microorganismal infections that you're uh, witnessing in uh, in your context? Uh, in our context, the most uh, reported uh, anti uh, microbial resistant bacteria were related to Enterobacteriaceae. Uh, in, pa in particular, we have also reported cases for, for uh, Klebsiella pneumonia, uh, for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, and uh, uh, Enterococcus. Uh, in addition to uh, uh, Staph aureus, uh, uh, in particular MRSA species, which uh, is uh, highly prevalent within uh, the uh, healthcare setting, uh, had, uh, even it's, uh, it was detected uh, in uh, nozzle swabs collected from medical staff. You can imagine uh, how, but this is at clinical level. You will find a lot of publication at the clinical level. Uh, but uh, you might be facing to uh, find uh, by challenge to find uh, uh, water resources related uh, uh, to uh, antimicrobial resistance. You will be finding uh, a lot of publication also about the wastewater and its relation to uh, antimicrobial resistance. But when it comes to water resources that used for drinking, for hand washing, 
it's limited, very limited in Gaza. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much, Rim. And uh, I think there is uh, another interesting question that comes from Dr. Ola Abara, who has been uh, uh, just having an intervention in one of the previous sessions that is asking to both Jean-Paul and Nabil, how sustainable you think that are uh, the, the innovations that are being proposed? Because they tackle the challenges in terms of diagnostic uh, or uh, human resource capacity in these specific settings. But at the same time, with all the challenges that are being described about staff fleeing and therefore capacity that needs to be ensured on a constant basis uh, and the lack of resources for maintenance of these devices, et cetera. So if, uh, if you could just briefly guide us on how sustainability of intervention is being incorporated in, in your projects. I don't know whom would like to go first, it's probably Jean Baptiste. If you want, yeah, thanks for, for this very interesting question. Um, so the, the point is that what we, for me, my personal experience on that, what I see, the complexity of, uh, of uh, innovation in humanitarian fields. And so as Nabi was saying, is really important because to use, uh, develop tools that are developed for high income countries or for modern society, uh, it's very complex. However, the difficulties that we have uh, is that this, uh, this um, we say innovation uh, are mainly, uh, done at the initial point, so the proof of concept, by humanitarian organization or university or, or, or people that, that want to, to go to this area and have some ideas. And, and the difficulties is to go to a much lower scale since to go to industrialization. And this is where is the difficulties. So that's why there are major or many, uh, many innovation that fails. Uh, not because they were not good, but because they didn't find a way to be industrialized. Uh, so this is the complexities that we have because one uh, innovation uh, can be applied to many other fields, uh, such as the one that we were discussing, but as well is how to pass this university environment and this, uh, this uh, specialist environment on the fields and, and to, to a much larger scales, uh, industries or, 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 or WHO or other scales that could diffuse uh, the website that you mentioned and other uh, technologies. I, I, I will just support uh, Jean-Baptiste uh, in his reply. Uh, in his reply. Uh, I think when we have innovation, uh, I think 50% of our efforts should be to uh, introduce the innovation and you know to, to uh, design and to, to do everything. And then the other 50% of our work should be to leverage the local capacities. So that's the only way to make this innovation sustainable. The, the local should take control after one or two years or three years or, or something like this. That's the first thing. And second thing, all innovations should be uh, 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 setting tailored. So if you are talking about Syria, it's a different setting from, from uh, Myanmar, for example, or India or et cetera. Uh, yeah, that's uh, this things will, will help, uh, you know, long-term survival of the, for the innovation. Uh, ju just one point to, to add, uh, Dr. Claudia, on, on what Nalbi was saying. Uh, and this is uh, something very important that he was mentioning to, to have the, the, uh, the, 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 the involvement at the local part and being able to, pr to produce locally, and especially with the arrival of tech new technology, 3D printing and stuff like this, it is now possible to do so. However, it's possible to do so in unregulated environments such as the, the wash or logistic, you can do. But the problem that we have in the field of medicals is that you need to comply with, uh, with regulation. And this is the complexity that we have is that it's, it's easy to do three printing of something that is not regulated in terms of, of, of whatever regulation, stringent regulation, but for the field of medical expertise, this is a complex part. Thanks. Indeed, and thank you very much for that. I wish we had more time because uh, it's an extremely interesting conversation, uh, but I, I am mindful we need to wrap up to leave space for, uh, for the next session. I think very important takeaway messages is the importance of ensuring that there's a solid base in that pyramid that, that Jean-Baptiste showed us. Infection prevention and control that entirely relies on wash intervention as uh, Reem shared with us the importance to improve diagnostic capacity and human resource capacity in low resource settings in order to have 
higher quality, good data to tailor then antibiotic stewardship interventions to the local needs, streamlining these interventions, not only at hospital level, but also at the primary level of care. Uh, and with this, I would like to leave the floor back to you, Aditi. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our speakers and our moderator for the session. Uh, thank you for sharing your experiences and recommendations for adapted antibiotic resistance responses.